So it's probably about eight months since we spoke before. We did a, a talk just before Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris did their very high profile discussions. And we talked about how to argue with an atheist. It certainly seems to me that there's a bit of a shift, whereas before the atheist worldview, the sort of quite cynical religious people are idiots who believe in what they believe, was dominant. Whereas now, I've seen a bit of a shift. It sort of seems that now the atheists are the ones that look a little bit naive because they're rejecting a huge amount of the world's knowledge, they're rejecting mythology, and that seems partly related at least to, to the growth of interest in Jordan Peterson. What do you make of that? Well, I first was aware of a shift um, actually rather earlier in 2013 uh, when my TED talk was so-called banned. You may remember there was a big controversy. I gave a TEDx talk on the science delusion. And then TED took it down following protests from militant atheists, P.Z. Myers and Jerry Coyne, who attacked TED. Uh, they didn't argue with what I'd said. They just said what I'd said was you know, pseudoscience, and TED had destroyed their credibility by allowing me to be there. I'm familiar that's with that kind of attack. Usually people don't argue with what I say. They attack the people who provide the platform. So that then led to a persistent controversy, which was very embarrassing for Ted. And to start with, the sort of atheist troll types dominated. But there was a kind of backlash, and gradually the whole tone of the debate shifted uh, uh, until they became a kind of minority. And that talk, which they, of course, couldn't ban, you can't ban anything on the internet anymore, has now had well over five million views. And the majority of comments are, you know, supportive. Most people can't understand why this talk should be banned or why even it should be controversial. I'm just raising scientific questions. So that was the first time I saw the shift uh, myself. Before that, um, anything by me was instantly attacked by uh, the kind of atheist, um, you know, the troll types. Because that is a huge paradox, because in that talk, the science... Was it called the Science Delusion yes. talk as well? You were saying there are certain things that you're not allowed to say because of the dogma of science, and the dogmatist science um, materialist then came down hard and said, basically proved your point for you. Exactly. I mean, it was ironic. I mean, they didn't get it themselves, the, 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 the irony of it, but um, that's what happened. And So for me, the first sign of a turning point was then, and I think it's um, accelerated this process. And I think Jordan Peterson has done a great deal to accelerate it, actually. And there is something about the nature of the sort of bottom-up sense-making of the internet is bypassing all of the gatekeepers now, the people mm. who have already made up their minds about you, for example. Mm. Yes, the, the internet provides a, a, an open forum for good or ill. I mean, all sorts of crazy people can get their views out on the internet. Um, but it's for me it's been very helpful because, because I'm a kind of proclaimed heretic in the world of science. I mean, it's not me that proclaims that, but I'm sort of branded as a heretic. Um, then the normal gatekeepers in the mainstream media are rather back off when it's anything to do with me because it's too controversial. It's not that they're afraid of the views I'm putting forward, they're afraid of people criticising them for allowing these views to be expressed. And are you, do, are you feeling at all vindicated yet, or are you, is that some way off yet? Well, the points I was making in the science delusion, the, the ten dogmas of science that I was talking about, uh, the changes that have happened in science since it came out have all gone in the direction I was suggesting. And the one where the, the greatest change has happened is in the chapter 11 of that book is called Illusions of Objectivity. And it's about um, the way that scientists believe that science is true, everything else is sort of false, but science is true because it's uh, replicable and because of peer review. And I pointed out in that chapter that the way science is actually practiced, the chance of it being replicable is pretty low. People publish their best results, they ignore results that don't fit their theory very often. And indeed, many journals won't publish negative results, or for that matter, replications. And then, two or three years later, 
there was this enormous thing blew up in science, the replicability crisis or the reproducibility crisis, where it turned out that in biomedical sciences up to 90% of published papers couldn't be replicated, in psychology about 60%. The majority of papers in top journals turn out not to be replicable. And this has caused an enormous amount of soul searching within science. I mean, the mood within science, normally, I, I grew up with it being like that, is arrogant. You know, we know the truth, we're the kind of new priesthood, everyone else is ignorant and basically deluded. Um, and what we say is true because it's replicable and it's subject to peer review. Well, it now turns out that a lot of it, most of it, is not replicable. And it turns out the peer review process is very badly flawed. Again, points I made in the science delusion. And funnily enough, the, the English cover of the science delusion has sort of crumbling letters of the science delusion is in crumbling graphics. And three years after the book was published, in the midst of this crisis, Nature, the top international scientific journal, uh, in discussing the replicability crisis, had a, a cartoon of the temple of science with the pillars crumbling and the whole robust science across the top, the whole thing crumbling, uh, which fitted this imagery very well. I'm working on a new edition of the science edition at the moment, so uh, delusion, so I shall include the uh, nature cartoon. Which is ironic as well, because nature was where the, the famous editorial was published that asked whether your book in 1981 was a book for burning. Exactly, yes. So um, nature has been at the leading edge, actually, of this discussion about the, rep the reproducibility crisis within science. And you, you also, in the same book, in The Science Delusion, which is called Science Set Free, I think, in America, mm. it's a lot of our, our view is also based in America, um, you said that we're seeing a credibility crunch for the scientific worldview. Is that more than just the replicability, replicability crisis? Oh, yes. I mean, I think it's... The area where it's most clear is in consciousness studies, I think, because um, until fairly recently, most of science is still the official materialist doctrine is that consciousness is nothing but the activity of the brain. It doesn't do anything. There's no such thing as free will. You may imagine you're conscious, but it's a kind of illusion or a kind of meaningless byproduct of the physical and chemical activity of your brain. I mean, that's the official view. And it obviously contradicts just common sense. Free will is something we have to take for granted. It's part of raising children, the legal system, courts of law. You know, it's, it's just the fabric of all normal human life. Otherwise, there's no responsibility. And uh, consciousness studies has also now started, well, for a while now, 20 years, been looking at near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences, um, spontaneous mystical experiences, uh, the effects of spiritual practices like meditation, um, and has enormously enlarged the sphere of what we can talk about in terms of human consciousness. And that means that the, the narrow mechanistic view of consciousness, it looks very threadbare. And in fact, quite a number of leading materialists are jumping ship and going over to panpsychism, the worldview that there's a kind of kind of mind or consciousness at all levels of nature, including electrons. Um, so that's been a massive intellectual shift. I mean, it's still materialism is the dominant theory in the universities and the educational system. You wouldn't get a hint that any of this has changed if you study science at school, for example. It's still locked into absolutely old-style old materialistic thinking. But at the leading edges of science and in the philosophy of mind, there's been a real shift in mood. How big is that shift, do you, do you sense? Well, I think that the um, shift is more, in, it, within the scientific community, is more under the surface than uh, over the surface. I, I think the number of scientists who are true believers in the kind of Dawkins-type materialist, neo-Darwinian worldview is fairly small. I mean, it's... It, we did some surveys recently through the Scientific and Medical Network in Britain. Among scientific, engineering and medical professionals in Britain, France and Germany, uh, sort of atheist materialists are about 25% of the scientific community. They're not a majority. Agnostics and non-religious people are about another 20%. So 
45% classify themselves as non-religious and about 45% classify themselves as spiritual, religious or spiritual but not religious. And so the spiritual slash religious uh, is about the same proportion, almost equal to the non-religious within science. So the idea they're all committed atheists and materialists is just not true. Uh, but the, they, the, the, the militant atheists and materialists tend to talk louder and, and claim that they speak for the majority and most other people keep quiet because they don't want to be attacked. And do you have a sense that that's what's keeping, because it's the gatekeepers more than anything, it's the people who are commissioning science programmes for the media or um, who, I guess, feel exposed <coughs> if, they, if they did something or they commissioned something that was not... Um, acceptable to the jerry coins of this world that they would then be attacked. Do you think that's what's keeping these other views out of the, the conversation? Yes, I think it's partly that. It, I mean, they would be attacked. They don't just fear it. They would be attacked because uh, that's how the jerry coins of this world work. They attack the gatekeepers. And for example, I was invited to give a talk uh, about three years ago to a leading independent school in Britain, Beedale School. They have an annual science lecture open to students and parents. It's a big event. And I was asked to do it and I accepted and I thought everything was plain sailing. And then the New Republic magazine in America published a, a, an article by Jerry Coyne attacking the school for allowing me to corrupt the minds of the young, saying this whole generation of young people would be lost to science uh, because they'd be influenced by me to... Uh, adopt pseudo-scientific views and he said I hope to his readers and he put this online too he, he said I hope you'll join me in emailing the headmaster of Beedale School to get Rupert Sheldrake disinvited and he put the email address and started a whole campaign to get me disinvited well luckily the headmaster you know just saw this as being a weird kind of American thing he and and the result was that the, it sold out within about two days and they had a, wait, a long waiting list. Um, but it, that's the standard technique and that's why gatekeepers in the media are frightened because they get personally attacked for, um, for doing this. So I think it's also the case that many people in the media are converted to converts to this sort of materialist worldview. I mean, they do personally believe it and they think that a lot of people in science education or at least science media feel it's their job to persuade the public that the world is as Richard Dawkins sees it or as Jerry Coyne sees it. What are the, the dogmas of science that you think need to be challenged? Well I mean the ten I mentioned in my book are the ones that I think should be challenged. I mean do you want me to go through all of them? I can, I can summarise yeah. them if you like. Yeah. Um, well the first is the mechanistic theory of nature. Nature is a machine. The universe is a machine. You and I are machines. Animals are machines. Everything's machinery. And what that means is it's made of unconscious matter uh, working in accordance with unconscious laws and forces. Um, and there's no purpose in the machinery. There's no consciousness in the machinery. Uh, the whole universe is unconscious. Um, the trouble is that, you see, when you think of the Big Bang Theory, the, it doesn't look anything like a machine, the, our present cosmology. It starts very, very small, and it grows, and it cools down, and more and more structures appear within it. The universe is much more like an organism than a machine. No machine starts very, very small, and then grows and develops, and develops more structures. That's how embryos develop. The Big Bang Theory is rather like ancient creation myths of the hatching of the cosmic egg. Um, so we've implicitly got a kind of organic cosmology and um, living organisms, uh, it seems to me obvious that they're organisms, not machines, and we call them living organisms and say they're not really organisms, they're just machines, which is what mechanistic biology says, is flies in the face of common sense and, and all our normal instincts. and. Um, and then, so that's, it's only a metaphor, it's not even a testable theory, it's just a way of looking at the world, it's a metaphor. Another dogma is nature's purposeless, and that just follows from the machine theory, machines 
don't have their own purposes. Organisms do. Um, you know, if you get on a horse, it may have its own ideas about where it wants to go, whereas you get in a car, it doesn't. You know, it'll go, it's just a, a mechanism that will follow exactly what you want. It's not interactive in the sense that it has its own desires. Um, the doctrine that matters unconscious says the entire universe is non-conscious or unconscious, all the stars, galaxies, the whole universe, everything, including you and me, we're supposed to be unconscious matter. So that's why consciousness in humans becomes a massive problem, the so-called hard problem. Um, and that's clearly not a very viable way of understanding our own consciousness, to so say it doesn't exist or it doesn't do anything. And that's the reason we have consciousness studies as now, luckily, um, as one of the most exciting areas of science. Um, so then there's the dogma that all the laws of nature are fixed. At the moment of the Big Bang, they all suddenly appeared like a cosmic Napoleonic code. And uh, where from? Well, no one explains that. They just suddenly appeared. Um, and uh, I think, in fact, they're more like habits. There's a kind of memory in nature. It's my own theory of morphic resonance is a theory of memory being inherent in nature. But it's not just me. I mean, Buddhist and Hindu cosmologies take it for granted there's a kind of memory in nature. It's only really in the West that there's this idea that nature's totally amnesic. Um, then the idea of the total amount of matter and energy is fixed. That again is a dogma that got built into science in the 19th century. But since then, to try and explain the behavior of galaxies, scientists have invented dark matter. There's not a shred of evidence for it, but they've invented at least five times as much as regular matter. And then having made the universe much heavier, um, they expected it to slow down in its expansion, um, more gravity because of more matter, all this extra dark matter. It, and uh, until about 1999, that's what they thought was happening. Then it turned out it's not slowing down in its expansion, it's speeding up. So they've had to invent another form of energy to push it apart, dark energy. And now dark matter and dark energy are 95% of reality, and we haven't a clue what they are. So this is, uh, so is the total amount the same? Does it change? Actually, the total amount of dark energy increases, so the um, universe is now a perpetual motion machine. Um, then there's the idea that memories are stored in the brain, and I think that that is not the case. I think it works by morphic resonance. The brain, I think, is more like a tuning system than a video recorder. Um, all inheritance is supposed to be material, genetic or epigenetic, and again, I think morphic resonance is a large part of inheritance. And attempts to explain inheritance in terms of genes have run into serious problems, as I show in my book, uh, The Science Delusion, because they've discovered that genes only explain 5 to 10 percent of most inheritance. Uh, it's called the missing heritability problem. Then there's the idea that the mind's nothing but the brain. Um, I think the mind's much more extensive than the brain. Um, and I think evidence for that includes evidence for the sense of being stared at and telepathy, uh, for which there's plenty of evidence. Um, that goes against the, the next dogma that psychic phenomena are illusory. They ought not to happen because all the mind's supposed to be inside the head. And the tenth dogma is that mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. The body's a machine, so treating it chemically or physically by surgery or drugs is the only valid way of doing it. But the host of alternative therapies and the placebo effect, which medicine has had to admit, um, show that there's a great deal to more to medicine than just drugs and surgery. I mean, any sensible doctor knows that, of course. Uh, people's attitudes, their expectations, their beliefs play an enormous part in whether they get better or not. People who are lonely, isolated, depressed, have reduced immune system functioning, less resistance to disease, to diseases. People who feel loved, prayed for, cared for, um, who hope they'll get better, who expect they'll get better, who have faith in those who are looking after them, do get better much more uh, than people who don't believe those things. So the mind influences it, and that shows up in the placebo effect, which is now very, very well documented. So medicine itself is it's very effective, 
up to a point, but the point is it would be much more effective if instead of excluding all these alternative therapies, dismissing them as pseudoscience and quackery, um, they were looked at scientifically and wherever anything works it should become part of medicine. And where did you, where did your interest in these subjects come from? Why, why did you have a different path to the, the kind of classic materialist scientist? Well, I became a biologist because I loved plants and animals. As a child, I kept a lot of pets. I collected plants. And my father, who was a, uh, micro he had a microscope lab at home and uh, was a herbalist and a naturalist. Uh, he encouraged me, so a lot of it came from him. Um, I did biology because I really liked animals and plants. And by the time I got to be an undergraduate where I was at Cambridge, um, I realised that the first thing you do in biology classes is kill what you're studying uh, and, and grind it up and analyse enzymes and things. I was doing biochemistry at Cambridge. Um, and it wasn't really looking at the things that I found most interesting. And, um, for example, as a child I kept homing pigeons and I was fascinated, and I still am, how do pigeons home? I, no one knows, even to this day. You're never going to find out by killing a pigeon and grinding it up and looking at the enzymes and the DNA in it. Um, so I, was, uh, uh, I just found that the questions I wanted to look at in biology weren't being looked at. and It was just in this reductionist molecular biological phase. Um, and I wanted to find a more integrative, holistic kind of biology, even as an undergraduate. I discovered the writings of Goethe, the German poet and, and uh, scientist, who had a vision of a different kind of science. Um, and I didn't know if that was possible, but I managed to get a year at Harvard to study philosophy and history of science to get the bigger picture, and realised that at any given time the beliefs of the scientific system are not the truth. They're a paradigm, a model of reality. Thomas Kuhn's book, the structure of scientific revolutions had just come out, where he has the idea of scientific paradigms and paradigm changes. So uh, from the age of about 21 or 22, I had the idea there could be a major paradigm change in science, and I wanted to find ways of accelerating that process. So this, for me, is a very long-term quest. My book, The Science Delusion, or Science Set Free, is the most systematic statement of this that I've done, but I mean, it, I've been working on bits of this virtually throughout my whole scientific career. And where do you feel we're at? Because there's a lot of people in this sort of broader conversation that are, have, a, have a sense of a, the need for a paradigm shift and perhaps accelerating, certainly even, even the, the structure or the, the way that we frame what we're doing on Rebel Wisdom is we believe that a lot of the, the paradigm shift is being speeded up by online media, by the sort of the, the ongoing crises we're seeing around us. Do you have a sense? I mean, it's very easy when we're in these kind of little worlds to think that, oh, it's, it's going to happen soon or we're on the verge of it. Um, do you have any sense of where we're at? Well, at least as regards science, there's no shift in the science education agenda. I mean, there's tiny pockets here and there of more alternative or holistic science, but the mainstream science agenda hasn't changed really. So generation after generation of young people are being indoctrinated with the mechanistic worldview, and it takes many of them years to grow out of it, if they ever do. So that's a major weakness and paradigm shift, but the educational system follows rather than leads, of course, it follows mainstream scientific thought. And mainstream scientific thought is very influenced by what you can get paid to do. Most scientists do what they're funded to do. They're on a short leash, two or three year grant cycles, and uh, they do what the grant money is available for. And the vast majority of it is available to support in medicine, you know, drug companies, molecular medicine, uh, sort of that kind of approach. The British Medical Research Council spends well, just under a billion pounds a year of our taxpayer, our money, uh, to fund medical research. How much of it goes on alternative medicine, placebo effect, mind-body medicine, you know, looking at Chinese or Indian traditional medicine, um, 
you know, acupuncture, and virtually none, because it's all focused on molecular medicine, mechanistic medicine. Uh, so it's an extremely narrow focus. So if you're working in medical research, you're not going to get funded to do anything that's outside that model. So there's plenty of people working within science who'd love it to be different. I mean, lots of scientists have more holistic views. They, in their spare time, have a, a sense of living nature and themselves as being part of Gaia, the planet, and the, the, uh, an ecological sense of the need to change. Uh, many have also experienced psychedelics or mind-altering substances or meditate or have spiritual practices. But when they get to work, it's a matter of doing what you're paid to do. So for me, one of the big ch changes that I hope to see is changes in funding. And <coughs> this is an area where private funding can make a really big difference. There are now more billionaires than there have ever been before. Many of them have got rich through science and techie type things. Um, and in the last two or three years, I've been approached by at least three major players in, in the billionaire world who've said that, that they'd like to find ways of making science more fun, more exciting, and are prepared to put money into doing that. And um, I, my, I myself have been funded privately for 30 years now um, by maverick business people who um, made their money by being mavericks. Um, who like the fact that uh, the kind of science I do is maverick science. They think it's more fun and more exciting than just more business as usual. And if it were possible to organize people who've got far more money than they can, than they can possibly spend, or to influence some of the larger foundations to be more adventurous, I think things could change. And I know enough people in that world to know that there are big players who would like to see a change, it's just they don't know quite how to bring it about. Uh, there has to be a means of setting up ways of doing this. One of my ideas is setting up a kind of dating agency for donors who want to see unusual science and people with non-conventional science projects and so that they can sort of meet, you know, have dates and, and, and um, see what works and, and put people together. Uh, this would have cut out the middleman in the form of funding organisations with big bureaucracies who demand enormously lengthy grant proposals and stuff. Most of these wealthy people don't want to wade through pages and pages of reports and grant proposals. They want a personal relationship with researchers who tell them what they're doing and, uh, who, uh, and uh, with the ability to fund something really new and exciting. So I think that's one way forward. In fact, it's probably the most promising way forward. The other way forward, I think, will come through a breakdown of the present healthcare system, which is just too expensive, and people will be forced to look for cheaper ways of bringing in healthcare. And most alternative uh, systems are cheaper than high-tech uh, healthcare. Um, so I guess it's kind of going back to a almost kind of renaissance patronage model, so like the Medici's and um, Michelangelo, for example. Yeah, I think, I think that's what, well, it's, it's actually, it's already happening. I mean, it's how it has worked for me. It's why I've been able to function as a scientist um, since I was sort of excommunicated by the editor of Nature uh, in his famous book for burning editorial. Uh, that He proclaimed me a heretic and tried to excommunicate me and believed that that would be the end of me. But it wasn't, because um, I've always been very fortunate to have people who've believed in what I do and who've been prepared to fund it. And one thing that helps is the fact that I, both as a matter of principle and personal disposition, I try and design the simplest possible experiments to get the most effective results with minimum cost. And, um, you know, I was brought up in that British minimum cost experimental tradition. Um, so, uh, luckily, this research isn't very expensive. And actually, in general, holistic research is much cheaper than reductionist research. If you're studying very small things like subatomic particles, you need a 10 billion euro Large Hadron Collider to do it with. 
If you're studying the behaviour of jackdaws, all you need are binoculars and a clipboard and paper or a computer. Um, so you can actually study things more easily if you're working at a holistic level. And your new book is going beyond the science of spiritual practice. Do you have a sense that, and, and also it's a sequel to another book called The Science of Spiritual Practice, is that because you're, you're seeing that as a kind of window of validating, validating spiritual practice as a way in to the materialist worldview? Well, partly. I mean, what I think is happening at the moment is the basis of my last two books, Science and Spiritual Practices and uh, Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, my most recent book, um, is that in each book I discuss seven different spiritual practices which have been studied scientifically, which have measurable effects. Um, because this is an area where science and spirituality are converging. It's not any longer that kind of old standoff sort of scientists saying all that stuff's rubbish, it's a waste of time. And it's not spiritual people saying, you know, science is just too crass and, 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 and just can't appreciate these things. What's happening now is that there have been many thousands actually of serious scientific studies of spiritual practices such as meditation, um, which uh, show how they affect physiology, brain activity, different regions of the brain, health and well-being. Generally speaking, these practices make people happier and healthier and live longer. Um, and so the science actually illuminates the spiritual practice and helps to validate it. And the spiritual practices enable anyone who wants to, to explore the realm of consciousness and its connections with more than human realms of consciousness, which is what spirituality is traditionally about. Uh, the idea that we're not the only conscious beings in the universe. I mean, I mean, the normal materialist view is we are the only conscious beings apart from animals who are less conscious than us, unless there are little green men uh, with a similar kind of science and brains to us on other planets. Uh, but all traditional religion is based on the idea that there's human consciousness is uh, one level of consciousness, but there are levels beyond ours that are more inclusive, uh, much uh, greater and higher levels of consciousness to which uh, we can form connections and uh, in which we can participate through spiritual practices. You, you mentioned before some of the forces that are stopping change. Are we, are we looking at sort of groupthink? We're looking at, do you think they're mostly financial or do you think they're mostly cultural? Well, they're both. I mean, most people who've been to university have been pretty well indoctrinated with the materialist, atheist worldview. Um, and if they're going to discover any other worldview, they have to do it outside the formal educational framework. So the, the educational system is, I think, you know, it's basically a hangover from 19th century materialism and enlightenment rationalism, which is Enlightenment rationalism is the idea that science and reason are in the vanguard of humanity. Religion and spirituality are just superstitions left over from the Dark Ages. And um, the scientists are the new priesthood. And we march forward in, through science and technology uh, to progress. I mean, that's the standard view. There's some truth in it, of course. I mean, we have much better smartphones and certainly much improved dentistry compared with 50 years ago. And uh, th there is a major advance in technology all the time. Um, but that worldview is um, underlying the educational system in practically every country in the world. That's what people are educated into. And that, I think, is a major obstacle uh, because it fills people's minds with this 19th century materialism. And in countries like India and Japan, people are educated with this. Most of them just don't believe it. They, they believe it when they're at work or when they're at school. But as soon as they go home in the evening, they become fairly conventional Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Jains or whatever. I've lived in India for seven years and very few Indians are materialist atheist types. But the science they do is like that. It's just that they see that as a separate compartment, a separate bit of their lives. Those are the rules. If you want to get ahead, you play by those rules. But you don't really believe it. You don't believe that's the ultimate truth. Whereas here, a lot of people do really believe it. And they feel that they can 
reject all traditional religion and spirituality um, because they now know the truth and anyone who believes these other things is uh, ignorant, deluded, childish, etc. Um, so I think that cultural thing brought about by our educational system is a major obstacle. The funding thing is also a major obstacle to the change in science. On the other hand, one of the things that's uh, positive is the, the spread of spiritual practices. I mean, millions of people now do meditation, whereas 50 years ago most people had never heard of it. Millions of people do yoga. Uh, millions of people do martial arts, uh, which is uh, explicitly recognized as a kind of spiritual dimension. It's about the flow of energy through you and uh, between you and your opponent. It's, it's not just brute force and muscles as uh, sort of force systems and, and bones as levers. I mean, it's, it's, it's much more subtle than that. And, um, and with the spread of psychedelics and the, uh, this new wave of research on psychedelics, um, where many people are actually experiencing altered states of consciousness. There is a massive shift happening, but it's not happening within the educational institutions or within the political institutions. Um, uh, but it's, it's very much, the internet is actually one of the main media for this change. And I mean, your program is part of that process. And who do you think are the, the really important thinkers that have probably been kind of not part of the mainstream of thought, but are really important that we integrate if we're, if we're going to move forward? Well, I think that the, the, I mean, Jung is one, you know, because he has a more inclusive view of the psyche than um, regular academic psychologists or the narrow and explicitly and dogmatically atheist views of Freud. So I think Jung is one of the key people in psychology. I think that the shamanic traditions of um, understanding our living connection with nature are another. And these would not be sort of famous people usually. They're, they're, they're traditions from which many people are learning uh, you know, in workshops and, and so on, but not, they're not like professors in universities. Um, an area that most people don't think about at all is, is theology. And there's some very, very interesting work going on in contemporary theology. Um, you see, after the 17th century the, in, in, in Europe, um, theologians had to adapt to the idea of nature as a machine. Scientists all had this idea of nature as a machine. And where does that leave God? It leaves God somewhere outside nature possibly creating it in the first place, like a kind of engineer or a mathematician, a kind of mechanistic god who's like a human engineer making machinery. And it's a view that worked quite well for an industrial age where it's all about machinery and engineers and mathematicians and engineers are at the top of the priesthood, as it were. Um, but the medieval view in the Christian West and in Sufism in Islam and in Jewish mysticism um, was that God is permeating nature, God is in nature and nature is in God. That you, uh, It's not that God's separate from nature but every moment of the natural world is sustained by the divine being. Uh, there's a kind of theophany, a revelation of God in, in plants and in animals and in humans, in the heavens and in all nature. What's happening now is there's a move in theology to go back to that mystical theology of the Middle Ages and reconnect with this much more inclusive view of spirituality. Um, and one of my favorite theologians is someone called David Bentley Hart, H-A-R-T, who wrote a book called The Experience of God, Being Consciousness Bliss, um, which shows that ultimate conscious reality as conceived of in Western, Eastern, and in other traditions, has much more in common these views than they have that separates them. It's basically a threefold model of ultimate reality, which the Hindus call Sat, Chit, Ananda. Being, the ground of being, is conscious. Chit is the um, contents of consciousness, names and forms, the kinds of things you think about or perceive. And Ananda is 
uh, joy or bliss which comes as part of this ultimate divine consciousness. The Christian version is the Holy Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Father is the ground of being. The Son is the Logos, forms, patterns, ideas, word. And Spirit is the moving principle which is uh, also blissful. And I think spiritual practices that involve movement like music and sports um, tap into this kind of spirit aspect. I think practices like meditation, which involve going to the ground of consciousness, um, relate to this sat or father aspect, the basic aspect of the divine, the sustaining the universe through conscious being. And the logos or the form aspect is what we appreciate through beauty, the beauty of flowers, the beauty of animals, the beauty of art, the beauty of architecture. So I think these different practices relate to different aspects of ultimate reality. And that's, as, as I say in my new book, Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, I think why they work is because they relate to this ultimate conscious being, conceived of in a surprisingly similar way in different traditions. I mean, even Taoism in, in the Chinese tradition, which starts from completely different philosophical principles, is, is, is essentially Trinitarian. It, you've got the yin and the yang, the, these polar principles that interact, each has a bit of the other within it. They're constantly interacting in this dynamic polarity, but they're contained within the circle. That's the wholeness that unifies, there's the ground of both of them. So that again is a kind of threefold model. Um, and these are only models. All these traditions say that ultimate reality, if it's the consciousness of the whole universe and also transcending it, is always bound to be beyond human conception, given that we've got limited minds that have adapted to dealing with practical problems on one planet in one galaxy. Highly unlikely that we could conceive of all of it. We can do our best, we can make models, but ultimately it's going to be beyond conception, known only through a kind of direct mystical insight. And how would you describe your um, beliefs now? Because I understand that you, you've you had a huge interest in different forms of spirituality, but I know now that you you are you a practicing Christian, or have you come back to Christianity in some in some way? I am. Yes. I, I when I was in India, when I went to India, I was still an atheist uh, from my scientific education, but my view of the mind had expanded through taking LSD in 1970 or 71 when I first took it. Totally changed my view of what minds were like. Then I took up meditation, transcendental meditation and yoga. So when I first went to India I was primarily interested in Hindu philosophy and then I had a Sufi teacher for a while and then um, I found myself drawn back to my own tradition which I'd rejected when I was a teenager. Partly because of my ideas about morphic resonance it's more, more natural for me to be in line with the whole line of my ancestors and my traditions, my whole culture is shaped by that. And to amputate it uh, is, is a kind of violation of the whole tradition and much better to come to terms with it, And I thought. And so I was actually confirmed in India at the age of 36. Um, and um, then I found a wonderful um, Christian teacher, a Benedictine monk who lived in an ashram in South India called Father Bede Griffiths an English monk who'd been in India for more than 25 years. And he, for me, was the perfect bridge between East and West. He was deeply knowledgeable and influenced by the Hindu tradition. We did yoga in the ashram. We had two hours of meditation every day. Um, and um, so that was, for me, a, a kind of integrative experience. Since I've been back in England, um, I rediscovered the... Anglican tradition in which I was brought up um, and just came to appreciate, in, in India I had appreciated the temples and the pilgrimages to them, I suddenly realised we've got these unbelievable temples here in England, the cathedrals, you know, astonishing buildings built to express an expanded consciousness, they're not functional buildings, these vast vaults and soaring structures are there to express a kind of altered state of consciousness. The stained glass windows in the Middle Ages when most people lived in huts and 
everything was sort of mud coloured, uh, would have been, you know, psychedelic. I mean, they're still psychedelic. Um, um, the, uh, the sacred chanting in these cathedrals happens every day in choral evensong, the service sung by incredibly well-trained and beautiful choirs um, in the evening. Um, uh, all these things are just incredible cultural wealth and to be part of it and to be inspired by it is, I find, quite wonderful. And then rediscovering the tradition of pilgrimage in England. I'm a patron of something called the British Pilgrimage Trust and we're reopening the old footpath pilgrimage routes um, to the holy places of England. That again is a, just a wonderful way to relate to the land and to tr the history and to these ancient holy places, but in a completely modern way. Um, the, one of the things the Pilgrimage Trust does is have apps that work on smartphones so you can find your way as you walk through the fields and the woods. Um, you can just do it with your smartphone, you know, whereas a medieval pilgrim, of course, wouldn't have had that. Um, and I myself make a practice of going to church every Sunday morning wherever I am, which means that I relate to the local community, to the local holy place, to have a space in the week when I can give thanks and pray and sing with other people. If I don't go to church, I don't have a space to, I just other things crowd in. The 24-7 culture sort of crowds in. And I find that, you know, singing with other people is a wonderful thing to do. It's a spiritual practice in itself. Um, praying for others and for the world is uh, with other people. I do it myself every day anyway, but to do it with others I think is more powerful. And to be in these old holy places, when I'm in a village, I go to the village church. There may only be three or four people there. But it's still, I find, I mean, sometimes it's boring, that sometimes there are boring sermons, often there are quite good ones actually. Um, but for me, they, I nearly always emerge feeling uplifted and in a better state to start the week than if I don't go and I just read depressing news in Sunday newspapers or, or, or have to deal with emails or something. I, so I find these really helpful, these traditional practices. Rupert Sheldrake, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.